Good morning and welcome. My name is Nancy Lindborg. I'm the president of the U.S. Institute of Peace, and I'm delighted to welcome everybody here for a very special celebration. Um, today, we are marking the centennial anniversary of the Republic of Georgia's first republic in 1918. So my warm congratulations to our Georgian guests. And I also understand congratulations are in order because the Georgian embassy won the soccer championship last night. So double celebration. <laughs> um, this morning's conference, uh, which is co-sponsored with our friends at the Embassy of Georgia and the Heritage Foundation, will celebrate the strategic partnership and the friendship between our two countries. And uh, it will explore both the security and economic achievements, the challenges and the opportunities facing our bilateral partnership. Um, and as we mark 10 years since the Russian invasion of Georgia in 2008, it's also my hope that we will be able to identify opportunities for a lasting and just peace in the Caucasus and beyond. It is my great pleasure to welcome back to the United States and to U.S. Institute of Peace His Excellency Georgi Kirviri Kashvili, uh, the Prime Minister of Georgia. I'm also delighted to welcome many distinguished members uh, of the Georgian government. We have His Excellency Mikhail uh, Yanalidza, Vice Prime Minister, uh, Minister, Ministry of Foreign Affairs of Georgia. His Excellency Dmitry Kumshishvili, the first Vice Prime Minister, Minister of Economy and Sustainable Development of Georgia. His Excellency Livani Zoria, the Minister of Defense, of Georgia, and His Excellency David Bakradza, the Ambassador of Georgia to the United States. Mr. Prime Minister and Excellencies, I want to take this moment to congratulate you on your National Day, uh, and I want to thank you for being a partner with USIP and the Heritage Foundation uh, for this conference. We look forward to the conversation, um, and we are very interested to have the kind of conversation that helps us learn about opportunities to strengthen the partnership and to build a just peace in the region. Um, and it is now my great honor uh, to introduce Prime Minister Kirviri Kashvili. He has led Georgia since December 2015. He was previously Georgia's Vice Prime Minister and he's also served as Minister of Economy and Sustainable Development and as the Foreign Minister. Uh, so this morning as we celebrate the Georgia-United States Strategic Partnership, we also want to recognize Georgia's contribution to regional security, to the international forces in Afghanistan, uh, and to the UN peacekeeping operations uh, in the Central Africa Republic and Mali. Mr. Prime Minister, thank you for your leadership, your partnership, and your friendship with the United States. Our warm congratulations on your National Day, and I welcome you to the stage to share your thoughts with us. Excellencies, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, I am honored to have this opportunity to open the second annual U.S.-Georgia Strategic Partnership Conference. And my thanks go to Nancy Lindborg, U.S. Institute of Peace, and to our many friends at Heritage Foundation for hosting this wonderful event. Last year's conference was the first of its kind, and it was a great success. A good idea is hard to suppress, and I note with considerable satisfaction that this year's meeting is called auspiciously the second annual conference. We stand, as they say, at the doorway to history. History is never far from Georgian's thinking. We have survived so much of it to arrive here today, and of course, the Georgia people are the heroes of this story. Hundred years ago, this month, Georgia took a leap into the future. We gave birth to the Democratic Republic of Georgia as turmoil, revolution, and civil war swirled around our small country, powered by forces much larger than ourselves. Our predecessors may or may not have realized at that existing moment that Georgia's independence 
our freedom would be delayed still further for nearly two-thirds of a century more. The Red Army swept into Georgia just three years after we reclaimed our statehood and at last temporarily, at least temporarily, swept our independence away. But we have been good and persistent stewards of our dream of independence and freedom. Such instincts are within our national DNA. One may speak of formal state independence arriving again in 1991, but Georgia's experience of statehood is much deeper, many centuries deeper. As a crossroads of civilizations, we absorbed much from and contributed much to all those around and while remaining uniquely Georgian and Western. A century ago, Georgia set its course inseparably with the West. Georgia is a not between land. Our culture is European with strong American accents. Our outlook is Western and transatlantic, as are our values and politics. Today, our economy is among the most dynamic in its region and indeed in all of Europe. Our commitment to democracy and human rights, the bedrock of Western and European values is solid, deep and sustainable. We are proud and active member of the transatlantic community and we only grow more or more so over time. The United States was among the first to recognize Georgia's independence in 1991. America supported us when we most needed it, during some of the most trying episodes of our own national consolidation. In the last 27 years, since our declaration of independence, Georgia has had no greater friend than the United States. Together we have crafted what may truly be called a strategic partnership. We take the reality of strategic partnership seriously. It is strategic because we share with our American friends a vision of our region and of Europe that is whole and free and at peace. It is strategic because we can look at the same facts on the ground and then share our intrinsic understanding of the importance of these realities to develop strategic uh, strategies for pursuing shared objectives. Each of us brings distinct uh, sets of analytical filters to the challenges we face. Our collaboration is aimed at devising the right strategies to achieve shared objectives. And it is partnership because the sharing is continual and mutual. The United States was quick to recognize the inherent challenges of Georgia's geostrategic position, especially its fraught relationship with Russia and the complexities of its larger security environment. But it was also quick to understand Georgia's advantageous geography, its power to demonstrate an advantages of democratic development and the unquenchable spirit of Georgia's dynamic people. For its part, Georgia understands and contributes to America developing and defending its interest in our region and democratic values everywhere. Georgia honors its part of the partnership bargain by fighting alongside America and its NATO allies in hotspots like Iraq and Afghanistan, where Georgia has suffered more casualties per capita than any NATO country except the United States. Georgia's spending on defense well exceeds NATO's 2% standard, as President Trump has rightly insisted on. We are proud to do so and to support our common security agenda. We are stronger together than apart. The literal meaning of partnership. The tempo of Eurasia is quickening from the stimuli of new trade routes like the emerging Transcaspian Corridor and the New Silk Road. New participants from around the world are now pursuing Eurasia's burgeoning opportunities. New friendships and alliances are forming from Europe to Asia. The significance of Georgia's unique position and therefore of the importance of its strategic partnership with the United States can only grow. 
Now is the time to pursue a bilateral trade agreement that will bring economic and security benefits to both of our nations. Partnership and strategy go hand in hand with peace and stability. Georgia is honored to be one of America's strategic partners, and we are extremely pleased that this annual conference will strengthen and deepen understanding of our partnership to everyone's benefit. Thank you very much. Good morning. My name is Charles North. I'm a senior advisor here at the U.S. Institute of Peace. I want to thank the Prime Minister and President Lindbergh for their remarks this morning, getting us started on this conference. We're now turning to the first panel. And so if I ask the panel to start uh, coming to the stage. Uh, the first panel is moderated by Luke Coffey. Uh, Luke is the director of the Allison Center for Foreign Policy Studies at the Heritage Foundation. And he is the author of the recent report, quote, uh, NATO membership for Georgia in US and European interests. Prior to becoming the director of the Allison Center, Luke served as the Margaret Thatcher Fellow in the Margaret Thatcher Center for Freedom at the Heritage Foundation, where he focused on transatlantic and European security issues. Luke, over to you. Thank you very much, uh, Charles, for the introduction. And I want to thank our co-host, the United States Institute for Peace and the uh, Embassy of Georgia for including the Heritage Foundation today on this very important event. This is the first panel of this conference. Um, and while the conference will look at <clears throat> the progress and path towards democracy over the past 100 years, we should not forget that Georgia's played a very special role in the history and the culture of the West for centuries, indeed millennia. After all, modern day Georgia is the location where Prometheus, the creator of mankind in Greek mythology, was chained to a mountain for punishment for giving fire to humans. A statue in the center of Batumi reminds us that the region is also home to the legend of Jason and his search for the Golden Fleece. We talk about the important contribution of Georgian troops today in Afghanistan, but we should not forget that Georgian soldiers actually first fought in Afghanistan in the 1730s in the same places where they are today around Kandahar. And Georgia's path towards good governance and liberal democracy did not start in 1991, it did not start in 1918, but in the 1800s. As the British diplomat and the foremost Cartavellian and first British ambassador to Georgia noted, uh, Sir Oliver Wardrop noted in 1888, I quote, it is interesting to notice that the political ideas of the country are borrowed from Western Europe. Excepting in Japan, perhaps, there is no instance of a people passing directly from feudalism to liberalism. The grandsons of absolute monarchs, the men who little more than a quarter of a century ago were large slave owners, are now the ardent champions of the democratic idea. And they loudly proclaim the freedom, the equality, and the brotherhood of prince and peasant and master and man. Now today's panel is gonna focus on the security and the geopolitical aspects of Georgia and the South Caucasus. Now in 1918, the Democratic Republic of Georgia faced a very complex and geopolitical situation as well. A German occupation followed by a British occupation, a fear of an Ottoman invasion and an actual Armenian invasion which led to a very bloody and short war for both sides. And of course the spillover from the Russian Civil War and the eventual invasion of Soviet Russia which led to the end of Georgia's democratic experiment until 1991. Today, Georgia also faces a complex uh, situation. 20% of its country is occupied by Russia. It's in a region, a very rough neighborhood, where if you include the Shkin Valley region and Abkhazia, and also the situation with the occupation of Nagorno-Karabakh and Azerbaijan, there are 25,000 square kilometers of illegally occupied territory in the South Caucasus. Even so, Georgia has not wavered from its commitment to Euro-Atlantic integration, and a lot of progress has been made. To, to talk about the progress since 1991 and the future of the U.S.-Georgian relationship, we have a very distinguished panel. 
First to speak is His Excellency Mikhail Janelitsi, the Vice Prime Minister and the Minister of Foreign Affairs of Georgia. After the Foreign Minister, um, Fiona Hill will speak, the Special Assistant to the President for, and Senior Director for European and Russian Affairs at the National Security Council. Uh, Mr. Robert Karam will follow Fiona. Robert is the U.S. Assistant Secretary for Defense for International Security Affairs. And finally, last but not least, is uh, Dr. Jim Carafano, Vice President of the Catherine and Shelby Colum Davis Institute for National Security and Foreign Policy at the Heritage Foundation, and more importantly, my boss. <laughs> so uh, <laughs> I would uh, encourage loud applause at the end of the panel. <laughs> yeah, there you go, there you go. <laughs> Uh, Minister, please. Thank you, Luke, uh, for this introduction. Thank you all for being with us today. This is a very important uh, conference. This is a very important day for us. Uh, we are holding uh, the second uh, forum conference uh, of strategic partnership between the U.S. and Georgia. And as Prime Minister mentioned, you know, we've done a lot to come to this uh, moment uh, and to reach this level of development and to reach this level of uh, partnership with the United States and we are proud to be a strong partner and uh, also I would uh, not hesitate to say that NLI in the region for the United States. Uh, we have gone through many difficulties as it was already mentioned but uh, we already uh, we always fought for freedom, we always fought for democracy, and we always fought uh, for, uh, to be part of a free world. In uh, 1918, uh, Georgia was one of the first uh, European democracies uh, aimed at uh, establishing um, the uh, free country with one of the best constitutions. Uh, for that time, ensuring all the rights uh, and uh, liberties. Since then, you know, we, although being under authoritarian rule, maintained our fight for, for freedom and for liberties. And uh, uh, in uh, 1991, we started building our new state and uh, institutions. We've done that with the help of the United States. And uh, today we are actually uh, proud to be one of the, among a uh, few countries uh, ready with its institutions and uh, capabilities to be a partner and ally for the United States. It's mostly about uh, democracy, it's mostly about uh, freedoms, but at the same time it's about geopolitics and uh, interests of the West in the region. In uh, 1918, uh, there were uh, big interests of the Western countries uh, uh, towards Georgia because Georgia was a gateway to South Caucasus as well as to Central Asia. Their geopolitical interest continues to be relevant today. Georgia continues to be a gateway to uh, the South Caucasus as well as to Central Asia. Uh, and uh, today we see big, uh, uh, actually, change in terms of development, which uh, I want to um, uh, address spe specifically. We see shift of economic development uh, uh, towards Asia, towards uh, Eastern Asia, but at the same time, this development moving towards the Central Asia. And uh, that is translated into more uh, transit routes, into more uh, economic cooperation in this corridor. And I think uh, the role of Georgia is rising in that regard. We are witnessing uh, enhanced uh, trade and economic cooperation between Europe and Asia. Only between the EU and China, uh, trade has uh, grown by 100% uh, uh, during the last 10 years, and th that trade will grow further. At the same time, uh, we see new projects uh, in energy developed in the region. Uh, we, see, uh, we will uh, launch uh, on 12th of June a new project, TANAP, 
which will bring new uh, Caspian energy to um, the European market. But there is still other resources uh, not delivered yet to Europe uh, from Caspian. And uh, Georgia continues to play a very important role in er energy diversification, and diversification of energy routes um, and supplies for Europe. So this uh, actually uh, makes Georgia, uh, again, relevant uh, for the West. It makes uh, relevant Georgia uh, for Europe and their generally uh, trans-Atlantic uh, unity and Euro-Atlantic community. But at the same time, with these economic factors together, we, uh, we see many security uh, challenges in the region. We are in a region uh, which uh, has still many conflicts, uh, active conflicts, uh, not talking about Georgian, uh, Georgia-Russia conflict, but conflicts around us. And uh, Georgia plays a very important role uh, for the West uh, and for the region in general, for keeping security, contributing to the um, uh, stability and uh, security of the region. We are the largest per capita uh, troop contributor to the Afghanistan mission, 870 soldiers. It's not about just being the largest non-NATO troop contributor. There are many NATO countries which have much less contribution to the Afghanistan than Georgia has. At the same time, time Georgia is uh, without any caveats. And uh, actually, we suffered the most together with the United States. And it shows how committed we are to the regional security, how committed we are to uh, uh, defend uh, the interests of the uh, transatlantic community and the Euro-Atlantic community. At the same time, uh, we are uh, we have become, from an uh, aid re uh, recipient country, we have transformed into a country which contributes uh, also to uh, the needs of the uh, Atlantic community with our spending and uh, defense uh, uh, readiness, with our economic development and opportunities for the Western businesses to um, uh, grow and uh, approach region. Uh, from Georgia and uh, to, have, to use Georgia as a good foothold for its interests and uh, to be a uh, partner in uh, defense and uh, security cooperation as well as in uh, trade economic cooperation. Here in these two directions we see uh, potential for next steps to step up our relations and to move from strategic partnership to maybe strategic alliance. Uh, we are very much interested to contribute and to work with the United States, not only in bilateral uh, format, but also in multilateral. You know that uh, we are fighting for membership in uh, NATO. U.S. leadership in that process is key and uh, uh, crucial. And uh, we were very much encouraged by the statements uh, just a few days ago by Secretary Pompeo, as well as statements by, by Vice President uh, when he was in Georgia, that Georgia will become a member of NATO. We are having all practical instruments in, uh, which are actually moving us towards membership. We have more instruments than uh, any other country uh, uh, being uh, a candidate country for NATO membership. And we believe that uh, uh, we are well prepared to make next steps uh, on our membership path. And we are uh, sure that when we are confident that Georgia will be a clear added value for the Euro-Atlantic security. Uh, and uh, <coughs> once we are members, we'll bring more benefits to the uh, interests of the Euro-Atlantic community. Georgia is an uh, important uh, player uh, in the region generally. We are working not only with the Euro-Atlantic community, but uh, we are working with our neighbors. We are working with Central Asia. We are working with East Asia. And uh, Georgia is, much, is very much interested to be a 
a very interesting bridge. We are part of Europe, but at the same time open for Asia and to be a, a reliable partner for everyone to cooperate in Georgia and to create new opportunities uh, with the help of Georgia. The, generally, the global environment is very difficult today. Uh, we know that uh, there is big uh, uh, challenge to the democratic development in general. And uh, we see that uh, the trends which we have uh, in the economic development, which we have in the uh, informational revolution uh, age, are affecting a lot the politics, internal politics as well as international politics. And uh, we need to find ways how to uh, find uh, ways to cope with, this, with those challenges, to uh, find uh, democratic outcomes, and uh, how to stand together uh, to uh, you know, be successful uh, in uh, building further peace and stability for your Atlantic community. Authoritarian regimes are very happy to see these challenges on a global scale. Uh, they are trying to actually challenge the Euro-Atlantic unity, um, finding these loopholes and cracks uh, through these developments on global scale, and we should not let them use that for their benefit. That's why I think in this period, especially uh, moving forward uh, with the uh, integration process of Georgia in Euro Atlantic institutions is critical. Georgia is at the front lines, and we should not let uh, the powers interested in actually uh, removing Georgia from this family uh, do it, and uh, it's time to make new steps in bilateral as well as in multilateral settings. Thank you. Thank you, that's absolutely right. And I think, um, I, I think any future membership, NATO membership for Georgia will be built on a very strong US-Georgia bilateral relationship. Um, and speaking of the US-Georgia bilateral relationship, we're very lucky to have Fiona Hill today with us. So over to you. No, thank you so much, uh, Luke, and uh, it's just such an honor and a privilege to be here today, I have to say, um, with such distinguished company to talk about um, a country that looking out into this audience I think is dear to everyone's hearts. I see so many people here who have been so invested in building up the partnership uh, between the United States and Georgia that we're celebrating today and who have been active in building this up for, I think, best part of three decades now. Uh, Georgia really is a very remarkable country, uh, part of a very remarkable region. And I think for the United States and you know, speaking here on behalf of so many of my colleagues from the National Security Council and from the White House and uh, across uh, the US government, it's a great honor to be the partner of what appears on the surface to be a young country but is really an ancient land with um, such a great uh, heritage that we can all share in. A little allusion there to the Heritage uh, Foundation. Yes, yeah. see, we, are, um, we can all build on uh, this, the, the great depth um, of um, the, the relationships and the contributions. As you said, Georgia is a great contributor, but the contributions that uh, Georgia has given uh, to um, Western and global uh, history and, uh, and culture. I mean, Georgia is a country that uh, is not just part of the region um, that Luke alluded to that gave us fire, that was forged in fire, yeah. in the fire of World War I. I mean, this is the 100th anniversary of the US entry into World War I as well. Uh, we've had a whole host of uh, commemorative events uh, to mark um, uh, what really brought the United States uh, most clearly into um, in the history of the last hundred years of Europe and of the Western world with the American um, intervention force. And Georgia itself was playing its own role, not just in uh, trying to exert its national sovereignty and fighting for its own identity um, on the ruins of uh, the Russian Empire, but uh, Georgians themselves were fanning out and starting to play um, a larger role in claiming that. I mean, I think of one of uh, the great heroes and great Americans, uh, General uh, Shalikashvili, 
um, whose family ostensibly came from Poland, but were part of that great Georgian diaspora that played such an important role in actually um, forging the Russian Empire um, in its uh, period. The, the Georgian royal family, Georgian warriors, Georgian generals uh, were really the backbone um, of the Russian um, imperial forces before moving out to become their own um, independent force. And I'd just like to um, celebrate and to thank uh, the members of the Georgian Armed Forces today who have stood with us um, at great cost to themselves, great self-sacrifice, collective sacrifice, in um, helping us with uh, our own expeditionary uh, wars to fight for our own uh, security uh, and, uh, and interests uh, from Afghanistan and also Iraq, uh, which we can't forget as well. We have so a few in the you. audience. Thank you. A few back there, there. I mean, this, this is part of a great tradition and a great history. Um, growing up in the United Kingdom, um, I actually grew up with lots of stories of Queen Tamara, uh, the warrior queen um, of the Caucasus, uh, you know, going back uh, to the period when Richard the Lionheart was um, uh, being a bit feckless, it has to be said, <laughs> across <laughs> Europe and falling uh, into captivity in various places. And always Queen Tamara, in the, at least in the legend and the stories, would somehow come to the rescue. Uh, and most people didn't realise, I think, in, in reading about her, that, of course, she was one of the great queens and the, uh, the great uh, progenitors of uh, so many legends and stories in Georgia as well, which Georgia is now able to claim as, uh, as part of its uh, heritage. I think the image of Georgia, not just as a contributor, but as a crosswords and a great gateway is important too. Because when you stand at a crossroads and you stand at a gateway, you look back as well as looking forward. And it's that great history, that great tradition uh, that we can celebrate with the 100th anniversary of reclaiming our independence, something that's very um, strongly fought for. I think, um, you know, as we look uh, to the other contributions, not just to our security, but uh, and also to that, that partnership, I'd like to give a shout out to someone I've seen in the audience here, Mama Kutseratelli. Um, who ought to kind of go down in the legends of the future legends of Georgia, <laughs> someone who brought Georgian wine back to the world. Uh, I know the Georgians and Armenians and others have a little bit of a battle of who was the first <laughs> creator of the wines that we know of today. I know that you say there's no story. I hope none of our Armenian colleagues are in the uh, audience today. But Mamuka, uh, I think without question, um, has been uh, someone who has uh, brought Georgian wine back to where it belongs in the pantheon of, uh, of great wines. I remember many years ago meeting Mamako when it seemed um, a very difficult quest uh, to make sure that uh, you would have a Georgian wine you know, on a, on, a, on a table in every American household. He's not quite there yet, but he's certainly uh, working uh, towards it. And I think that that actually shows, um, again, uh, the evidence of the great potential that, uh, that Georgia has looking forward. As Foreign Minister Jan has uh, talked about, when you're thinking of free trade and the great spirit of that, Georgia has uh, so much to offer. Uh, the potential of Georgia as a tourist destination. Uh, my own niece got in touch with me recently saying that she was thinking for um, uh, her summer vacation of going to Georgia. Did I know anything about this and could I recommend <laughs> anyone? <laughs> Do I know something about Georgia? And I told her how I recalled my own first encounter uh, with the great hospitality and beauty of Georgia in 1988, so 30 years ago. In fact, it was actually 30 years ago this month. Uh, shortly before I met uh, the great Teda J uh, uh, <laughs> Japaridze, <laughs> uh, which came just a little bit later uh, from that. But I was a student in the, what was then the Soviet Union, took a trip to Tbilisi and burst into tears, I have to confess, when I first looked out of Tbilisi, thinking I'd never seen anything quite so beautiful. This was after, you know, kind of a long winter <laughs> in Moscow, <laughs> stuck in uh, side when it was minus uh, 20. <laughs> Spring had broken out all over the place and I stood on, uh, you know, what was uh, one of the vantage points looking out of Tbilisi and thought, really, my goodness, can somewhere really be look like this? Yes. And T Tbilisi looks even more beautiful today uh, after, uh, you know, shaking off uh, the dust uh, of uh, the old uh, Soviet Union and becoming one of uh, the most beautiful uh, countries uh, again, as it always has been uh, in the region. You can see that I could go on and on here, but I just want to say again what a great honor it is uh, to be able to represent um, now today the National Security Council and the White House um, after uh, such an amazing uh, period that uh, George has gone through, that all of us here in the audience have gone through uh, today. And I'd like to celebrate everybody who is also here who has played a role in this. Um, I see Judy Ainsley, who um, was in uh, this same position 10 years ago uh, during the very fateful um, period of um, the uh, Russian invasion of Georgia. And we've come a long way since then. And I think that um, everyone here, and especially our colleagues from Georgia, should be very proud of the accomplishments. And uh, um, it's a great honor, again, for us to be able to celebrate with you your 100th anniversary 
as well as the second annual uh, conference on the strategic partnership between the United States and uh, Georgia. And thanks to our colleagues from SIP and from Heritage for putting this on. Thanks, uh, Fiona, for, for those. Um, Thank you, for everyone. Th thank you for those very uh, personal and passionate remarks. Um, Robert? Uh, well, Luke and Nancy, thank you uh, for the invitation to be here and to uh, the U.S. Institute of Peace and the Heritage Foundation for putting together the second annual uh, conference on this incredibly important strategic partnership. Uh, it really is an honor to get to represent the Department of Defense and talk a bit uh, about uh, our important and blossoming uh, defense relationship that I think has really been truly important for both of our countries. Um, I'll be very brief, uh, not only because uh, I think we'd all like to get to questions, um, but also because even with prepared remarks, it would, hard, it would be very difficult to be as eloquent and comprehensive uh, as the foreign minister uh, and Fiona, and alas, I do not have prepared remarks. Um, <laughs> but uh, looking back at just the history uh, that we've already talked about this morning, a uh, uh, 100 years since Georgia's uh, original uh, independence, um, 70 years of Soviet occupation, 27 years of independence since 1991, 10 years since um, Russia's unprovoked uh, invasion uh, in 2008, uh, and as Secretary Pompeo noted just this week, um, Russia continues to occupy 20% uh, of Georgia. Um, it's hard not to be uh, impressed and surprised at the progress that Georgia uh, has made um, in spite of so much adversity um, and a commitment um, to uh, defending uh, its people uh, and its values. Um, and its commitment to Euro-Atlantic integration uh, is, is truly impressive. Um, I looked back at the U.S.-Georgia Charter, um, and I know some uh, people uh, in the audience had something to do with it. In the wake of Russia's uh, most recent invasion uh, of Georgia, uh, and I think it's important how uh, prescient uh, that document was uh, and how it stands uh, up after, after a decade. Uh, and it speaks to our shared values, uh, our common interests, um, the importance of the rule of law, um, the importance of territorial integrity, the in inviolability of borders, uh, and the importance of sovereignty. Um, all principles that are under assault um, today, um, uh, in part uh, or in particular by, by two countries uh, that are national security strategy uh, and national defense strategy name. Um, Russia uh, and China, um, who seek to undermine uh, the rules-based international order um, uh, that uh, has, has uh, helped to create the conditions uh, for uh, such peace uh, and prosperity. Um, but that peace and prosperity uh, will only last if we can defend it. And it's very important um, for the United States uh, to have partners uh, like Georgia uh, who are so willing uh, to contribute to our common security. Um, and here, I would like to pay a special homage to uh, Georgia's armed forces who have been with us in Iraq, in Afghanistan, who contribute to the UN mission uh, in Mali, uh, and are very, very far away in, as Nancy said, the Central uh, African Republic. This has come at considerable cost. Um, dozens of Georgian soldiers uh, have been killed. Um, hundreds wounded over the course uh, of their time uh, in these conflicts, conflicts that are far away from Georgia. Um, but the things that we are fighting for as partners, um, I think, resonate uh, in Tbilisi as they do uh, in, uh, in Washington. Um, more recently, uh, I think we've been very appreciative uh, of not just the extent to which Georgia has contributed to these common causes, but it's taken its lessons and helped others. Um, and uh, its own efforts to treat its wounded warriors uh, are paying dividends in how Georgia has helped Ukraine, um, uh, the latest victim of Russian aggression, uh, treat uh, its, its own wounded warriors uh, and incorporate them back into, uh, society, into society. Um, uh, I also want to acknowledge, um, I think, um, uh, a relatively new program, the Georgia Defense Readiness Program. 
um, which has taken a long-standing program aimed at helping Georgia contribute more effectively to these international efforts um, and make sure that as the United States helps train uh, and equip uh, Georgian soldiers who are going uh, to, to fight uh, in Afghanistan, um, that we are also focused on the long-term uh, effort to help Georgian, Georgia's defense forces um, uh, uh, provide for their own security uh, and territorial defense. Um, and uh, this is not simply something that the United States does. Uh, it's a shared program. And Georgia's own investment in training ranges and bases uh, and capabilities um, really highlights the extent to which this is a true partnership. Um, uh, just another uh, quick word on defense reform and defense institution reform, uh, where Georgia has really been uh, a leader, and I want to recognize uh, the defense minister and his team um, for their continued efforts to make very, very tough decisions. Um, Um, in reforming not just the ministry, um, but also tough decisions about acquisition and personnel um, that are hard uh, in our system uh, and hard uh, in the Georgian system. Uh, and that Georgia has been able to make these decisions uh, despite the occupation, despite uh, the pressure, uh, I think uh, really uh, is a model uh, for other countries, whether they are in NATO uh, or not in NATO, of the need to modernize and reform uh, militaries uh, to meet the challenges uh, of today. Um, and I suppose I would just close um, with uh, noting uh, the progress that I think is being made uh, towards NATO membership, uh, the opportunities that the uh, Enhanced Opportunity Partnership uh, present and that Georgia has taken advantage of, uh, and to reiterate Vice President Pence's uh, statements uh, last year, um, that uh, Georgia will be uh, a member of NATO. Thank you. Robert, thanks for that uh, overview of the U.S.-Georgia defense relationship. Um, it's flourishing. It's heading in the right direction. as positive news. Um, it's also, we talk a lot about Afghanistan, Georgia's contribution to Afghanistan, but it's also worth pointing out to a, a reminding, actually, I should say, that at the time of the invasion in 2008, Georgia, I think, had the second most number of troops in Iraq um, after the United States. Um, so this commitment, um, you know, sort of predates um, its uh, need for greater security after the uh, invasion. Um, now over to uh, Jim Carafano to yeah, wrap us up. Give me a second. No, I always like to check to see if President Trump tweeted anything about Georgia before I... <laughs> no. hey, I do that for my, all my public remarks. Um, <laughs> no, I want to, I want to say, uh, I have three points I want to make. And, and the first one is I want to say the things that Robert and Fiona can't, right? Which is to explain President Trump. Um, because I do think it's important when we talk about this relationship that we put it in context, the larger context of what this administration is doing and what the president is trying to do. So when, when Donald Trump says America first, what he means is it's his job to put the vital interests of his country at the forefront of every single decision he makes. And I think why that's important for this conversation is, is if you believe that your job is to protect America's vital interests, then at the very top of the list is the peace and stability of Western Europe. That, that literally, that is an anchor of America's place in the world and, and comes above everything. And, there's nothing more key to that than uh, the success of the transatlantic community and the transatlantic partnership. That has to be at the very top of your agenda if you're serious about protecting us and our peace and freedom and prosperity. And I think this administration's been very clear in its actions about what the great threats to that are. And they are the destabilizing policies of Russia and also the potential of challenges in the Middle East to bleed over and affect the stability of Western Europe. This administration gets that, and it's the forefront of all their policies. And while that's important to th this conversation, is because Georgia is a cornerstone in that strategy. Georgia is a corner of Europe that is vital to, to complete that whole piece of, of transatlantic security in the US-European partnership. And so that, I think that message and, and that position really, I think, is the shadow that frames everything we think about when we think about the US-Georgian partnership. Then the other thing I would do is, the second point I would make is to ask, say the things the minister can't say, right? This is what he should be asking for from us. And I, and I think there ought to be two big asks. 
Um, the first thing I think is that we bring Macedonia into NATO and that, and that that happens. And it would be great if it happened this summer. And I think that's actually be, would be, uh, is very important to Georgians for a couple of reasons. Um, first of all, it would demonstrate in the ascension of Macedonia that NATO figures out how to deal with complex issues. Uh, and, and, I, and, I, and I think that's an important message to send. The, the second one is, is that the, the door is always open because NATO is an alliance of nations that love freedom and security and work to want to work in common cause to that. And nobody can dictate to the members of NATO who they can and cannot invite into that community. And, and the third thing I think is, honestly, is it clears the decks because honestly, after Macedonia, there is only one country that is ready and qualified and where we need to take seriously, and that is Georgia. So I think it just moves that ball one step closer to what inevitably has to happen. Um, you know, the other thing I think I'd ask for from the United States is, um, many of you know about the, the Three Seas Initiative, which is a great initiative. It's largely really a, a, an initiative of EU countries. And it's you know, primarily designed to kind of build this um, economic and energy backbone uh, you know, across uh, um, northern and central Europe. And uh, I do think it is, is um, has, in many ways, is really key to the, to the healthy future of a prosperous and secure Western Europe. Um, and that's fine. The you know, Visegrad and the EU, they should have a three season initiative. But I think the US ought to look at that. And I think our initiative, and we ought to broaden that, that we ought to think of that as a four seas initiative, right? Because there are two very important bodies of water that kind of fall on either side of Georgia. And that integrating that fourth sea into this concept and into that economic development program, I think is something that is great for the transatlantic community. And I think it's something the United States ought to be, be uh, front and center in doing. And then the, the third point I would say is, is, is my optimism for all this. And it's simply because Georgia has paid its dues. Georgia has earned the right to be a member of the transatlantic community and to stand with the other free nations. Oh. No, I mean, I, th I mean, the reality is, is, is if Georgia has not earned America's friendship and confidence and trust and partnership, then really, what other nation in the world really has? So, thanks. Great. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> still, right. still no tweets. Yeah. Just, <laughs> we're good. Um, before we open up to questions, I'm going to pose a couple uh, myself. Uh, first to um, the minister, what would you um, define as success for Georgia at the upcoming NATO summit? Well, what are you hoping for, just broadly yeah. speaking? No, I'll be very specific. Uh, we are anticipating the, actually, uh, decision which will uh, define the reality. The, the reality is that Georgia has uh, improved uh, and uh, changed and uh, uh, came to the um, standards of NATO uh, uh, very successfully. During 10 years, we changed our democratic institutions, we changed our uh, economy, we changed our uh, defense and security system. We have all instruments in place which are preparing us for membership. And it is recognized by NATO. And I think that this reality should be uh, clearly recognized uh, on the, at this summit. To be honest, we are ahead of uh, even some members of the alliance with our readiness and uh, uh, all the institutions, also with our contributions. We know that what is the key factor there uh, in the decisions, and I think that uh, there should be uh, more political uh, understanding uh, to move 
with the membership in Europe and also in the United States. When we are talking about Macedonia, uh, we were very happy also that Montenegro joined NATO. We are happy that Macedonia is uh, on its way to membership and we wish them uh, success uh, on that path. But uh, I think when we talk about Georgia, it's more about a political decision. And we need to work and find that political decision. Uh, we look forward to this kind of talks uh, on this summit. Right. Well, not only do we have a very distinguished panel, we also have a very distinguished audience. Uh, I see a lot of Georgia watchers, followers, supporters, experts out there. And um, one of my favorite parts of panels like this is actually the Q&A uh, section of it because uh, you learn so much as a panelist, too. Um, so I'm going to open it up to the floor. We have microphones on, on both sides. If you could please um, state your name and any affiliation that you might have. Um, that would be very useful. Um, do I see? Uh... So nothing that was said was even slightly uh, controversial. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> no, I don't want to. Um, yes, sir. We have a uh, from from here. Can't quite make out the rank, but a Georgian officer. Uh... Thank you, Colonel Kaptaradze, Georgian Army, uh, currently attending the National Defense University, College of Internal. Uh, College of International Security Affairs. Yes! <laughs> <laughs> yeah, my question is uh, the following Georgian aspiration to, to NATO, to, to join the NATO. Uh, what are your thoughts, if it goes to minister and to other ones, um, to, the, to the idea which, by, which was announced by moderator of this panel, Mr. Luke uh, Coffey, uh, joining NATO as a whole nation without occupied territories until the, they are deoccupied peacefully, uh, especially having uh, in mind uh, the examples of uh, Germany, Guam, and so on. Thank you. Maybe for the benefit of the audience, I could quickly summarize the proposal the gentleman is talking about. Um, because this is DC and there's no such thing as shameless self-promotion, uh, <laughs> There's a report out there that uh, I, I wrote and that I published um, that uh, one of the proposals, thinking of a creative, uh, a creative and realistic way to get Georgia quickly into NATO, was a, an idea that because Georgia already has a non-use of force pledge to get back the occupied regions, why not invite all of Georgia to join NATO, but set aside the occupied regions where they don't get Article 5 protection until that conflict is resolved peacefully. And this isn't questioning Georgia's territorial integrity. All of Georgia would join. Uh, but there are examples of uh, NATO members that are in NATO, and not all their territory is under Article 5 protection. Uh, Falkland Islands for Britain, Guam for the United States, for example. And this would require an amendment to um, Article 6 of the 1949 North Atlantic Treaty. Article 6 describes where Article 5 is applicable. And in 1952, this was amended when Turkey and Greece joined. Um, when Algeria became independent, Article 6 was changed again because before French Algeria was included under Article 5. So there's a precedent for this. So that's the uh, proposal that the, uh, the, the gentleman was talking about. Not giving up on Georgia's territorial integrity, but finding creative and new ways to maybe speed up the process. So. Um, I think the question was addressed to you, of course, Minister. Oh, you're you. probably tired of answering this question because <laughs> we've said on other panels before where you're asked this as well. Yeah, and our answer is clear there. So, um, first of all, the territorial integrity uh, of Georgia uh, is uh, the most important issue for Georgia. And uh, uh, everything what we are doing, uh, Euro-Atlantic integration or European integration, our membership in NATO, etc., uh, these foreign policy priorities are oriented to uh, finding ways how to restore peacefully uh, the uh, territorial integrity of Georgia. NATO membership for us is uh, uh, an opportunity to build an even stronger democracy, uh, to build even resilient, more resilient country, able to uh, protect uh, all the rights uh, of its uh, 
people living on the whole territory of Georgia, to create a country, an attractive country for uh, everyone. Uh, so, an opportunity for uh, reconciliation, an uh, opportunity for more engagement, and uh, actually uh, new prospects for everyone. This is the case in, uh, uh, in, in relations and in regards with the European integration. You know that we have association agreement with the European Union, which is, has deep and comprehensive free trade area agreement. And uh, we are trying to share the benefits of that uh, European integration process on the, uh, with the people living in the occupied territories. We have elaborated a new mechanism and uh, new, uh, actually, mechanisms uh, and programs for sharing those benefits with the people living in the occupied territories. When it comes to uh, NATO's position, NATO's position with regards to the territorial integrity of Georgia is clear. NATO is the most important and for us uh, a key uh, guarantor of our territorial integrity. And uh, I think when it comes to the question, uh, you know, application of Article 5 on the occupied territories, it's more of a, a technical part of a political decision. Thank you. And, and I'll just add to that, that the reason why this proposal would work for Georgia, not for Ukraine, for example, is because of that non-use of force pledge. Um, that's what separates you know, Georgia from other uh, countries that aspire to join NATO but are also involved with, with conflicts with, uh, with Russia. Right. Um, I knew that one was coming. I'm glad we got that out of the way quickly. Uh, any other uh, comments, questions, uh, remarks? Now, I, I see, um, I, I'm going to call him out. I hope he doesn't mind. But we're very lucky to have in the audience the Adjutant General of the Georgia National Guard, Georgia, the state, uh, Major General Gerard. So I was wondering if maybe you could just give us a comment or two about what your state is doing um, uh, to help uh, Georgia in the relationship. Well, we have uh, had a relationship with the country of Georgia military for about 24 years now. So next year will be 25 year anniversary. We're very honored and uh, we've cherished that relationship. It's a great one. Uh, probably about 10 or 12 times a year, we travel to the country of Georgia or some of their members come to our state and we work together to get better. And uh, so that's us getting better and uh, helping them to improve as well. So uh, some of the things that we have worked together on could be anything from military uh, decision-making process at, at different levels of staffs to also uh, currently our chaplain corps is working with uh, the military in Georgia to develop, uh, to help them improve their chaplain corps or to develop a chaplain corps. They do it differently than we do. They have priests that are not in the military uh, that minister to them and so forth. So just talking about those type different things. and. Uh, and we will get together with uh, General, I don't think General Chachabaya can make it uh, next, uh, in a couple of weeks, but Europe uh, has a state partnership program conference every year uh, in uh, Germany, and we'll, I'll meet with uh, a representative of their leadership and their SART major, and my SART major and I will go over and, and uh, participate in that conference here in a couple of weeks as well. So um, just a great relationship. We're, we're Georgians, so it, it works, and, and we, we, uh, we're brothers and sisters, and uh, it, it's a great relationship, and, and we both get better from it, so we yeah, cherish th it. Thank you, General. Sorry for putting you on, on, the, on the spot there. But yeah, that state partnership program is so crucial when it comes to building the capacity and capabilities of our European allies, and uh, you know, to make it as confusing as possible, the state of Georgia, uh, of course, was assigned and paired with the Republic of Georgia. Um, turning back to the panel, uh, I was wondering if maybe Fiona or Robert could give um, some insight on the, the thinking behind the decision with Javelin, um, some of the logic behind it, and uh, maybe talk about what you know, the, the next steps of the U.S.-Georgia security and defense relationship can be. Because a lot of times with the discussion of Javelin, whether it's Georgia or Ukraine, many people think this is like some magical silver bullet. Yeah. Um, but it's not. Um, it, it's a part of what should be a larger strategy. Um, so 
Could either of you uh, say something? Well, I'll um, leave the, some of the specifics to Robert because this is very much the purview of uh, this overall defense relationship that Robert's talking about. But I just want to um, uh, underscore what you've just said. I mean, certainly the thinking behind that was very much as part of a broader strategy uh, towards uh, Georgia. Um, uh, uh, there is no um, silver bullet uh, for building up any kind of defensive uh, capability, and I think that it's you know, a testament to our colleagues from the state of Georgia and from the long-term, uh, long-standing uh, military relationships at all kinds of different levels, and the commitment of uh, the Georgian um, armed forces uh, to train with us, uh, to fight alongside of us, uh, Iraq, Afghanistan, and in other expeditionary um, uh, ventures that is really the secret of uh, Georgia's success and its ability to be able to defend itself and to also project um, its influence, which I'm you know, pretty confident that Georgia will be over time, more broadly in the region and through uh, you know, this, uh, uh, the, this network of uh, military defense and other uh, political contacts uh, throughout uh, Europe. And the partnership that already exists between uh, Georgia and uh, NATO at this, uh, at this stage. So you can't think of one particular system without thinking of uh, the entirety of uh, the uh, defensive yeah, posture the whole, whole uh, and, and the whole uh, package of the relationship with Georgia as well. And I think it's actually unfortunate that there became so much fixation on the issue <laughs> of, uh, of javelins uh, in the media and elsewhere and, and making that seem as if this was a momentous uh, decision in of itself. And the momentous decision was really the decision that Georgia took, uh, you know, 25 or more years ago uh, to stand with the United States and to build up this partnership with us. Yeah, no, I, I, hard to improve on that. I would say just a couple things. First, the silver bullet is not a single system. The silver bullet really has been Georgia's commitment to defense reform and modernization um, and a willingness to spend um, uh, money on capabilities that will allow it to, to help uh, the Georgian military defend itself uh, against uh, aggression. Um, and uh, I would tie this back to the U.S.-Georgia charter, which commits the United States to help uh, Georgia responsibly defend its own territory. And I think the steps that Georgia has taken um, uh, in the 10 years since that document was signed made this an easy decision, um, uh, that uh, Georgia's commitment, uh, its responsible uh, and reliability uh, as a partner um, made, uh, made the decision to sell this capability. Uh, I think quite quite easy for us. Um, but as I said, it is not the silver bullet. The silver bullet really is the sustained commitment to uh, defense modernization uh, and and uh, and reform. Uh, I would say one more thing um, to connect back to something that Jim had said about the Three Seas Initiative, um, uh, the Baltic, Black, and Adriatic. Uh, there's a different Three Seas. Um, C is in the letter um, that we talk about in the NATO context. Um, cash. Um, capabilities uh, and contributions. Um, cash, meaning how much money is a given country willing to spend on its own defense, 2% being the 2014 Wales Pledge. Capabilities, how are they spending that money? Um, uh, the Wales Pledge uh, highlights the extent to which we would like to see, NATO would like to see its members spending more than 20% on capabilities and modernization. And contributions, to what extent uh, our country is contributing to the common defense of the alliance. Um, and here, uh, I would highlight, um, if you use this 3C approach, um, Georgia really excels. Um, and that, more than any individual system, I think highlights the, the extent which is a capable part. So, I, actually, let, let me ask you a question. All right. Um, not, not to go too far afield, but, but I think that since Americans and Georgians have contributed so much in, in Afghanistan, and it's worthwhile, and you do Afghanistan for us, you served in Afghanistan, talking about why we should continue that, why we both should continue that commitment in the Afghanistan mission. Yeah, well, um, you know, Georgia is right up there, as was already pointed out, with its commitment to Afghanistan. And I think it's because of um, two main reasons. The, the first is that uh, Georgia wants to be seen as a net contributor to uh, regional and global security, and that's why it plays such an important role. But also, Georgia sees the potential of what could happen in Afghanistan around the world if we were just to cut and run. Um, you know, it's been well said, I'm sure many of you have heard this fact before, but I think it's 20 out of the um, 
almost 100 uh, U.S. designated terrorist organizations operate in the Afghan-Pakistan border. Um, and now is not the time to, um, you know, to, to leave this mission, which is now a training, advising, and assisting mission. And uh, it's important that the U.S. leads the way on this matter, because if the U.S. leads on it, then other countries like Georgia and our European allies will, will follow. And Georgia, I mean, really uh, sets itself uh, apart from other countries, um, whether in NATO or not in NATO, in terms of its uh, very important contribution. And I know there's going to be a decision coming up sometime this summer on the future of the U.S. and NATO mission in Afghanistan, and it's important that we we, we take a reasonable, realistic, and a responsible approach to that operation, and no doubt Georgia will be a, a part of that. Um, in my report, uh, I, I highlight, um, moving on to a, a different subject, I highlight um, the, the different cases of what is called borderization um, of, of Georgia, of the two occupied regions, the Shkin Valley, also called South Ossetia region, and, and Abkhazia. And basically, these are cases of Russian-backed forces or FSB forces um, physically moving a boundary or a border where a Georgian will go to bed and free Georgia and literally wake up and occupy Georgia. Or farmers are, have their crops divided or, or sign, signs are posted, fences are built, di uh, ditches are dug. And uh, I've, uh, through a lot of research, um, mainly with the help of my research assistant, Alexis, she spent a lot of time uh, finding GPS coordinates of small Georgian villages. She's the leading expert on Georgian villages. And uh, uh, we, we uncovered uh, 56 cases of borderization at 48 different locations since 2011. And uh, these have a real impact on the lives of the Georgians that live in this region. So I was wondering if the, if the minister could talk about you know, what George is doing to raise aware of this on the international stage, um, what you're doing for your non-recognition policy, um, what you're doing to um, show the people that are living in occupied Shkin Valley region or Abkhazia that they do have a place in Georgia, that they are Georgian, that the Georgian government and the Georgian people care about them. Because I know there's been some recent initiatives with this that um, are, are trying to bring the communities together wherever they can. So I was wondering if you could expand on some of those, yeah, please. Thank you. Uh, thank you for this question and for raising this issue. This uh, occupation of our territories remains to be the greatest challenge for Georgia. And it's not only about occupation today, but we see the process of factual annexation of those regions through the so-called integration treaties. Uh, Russia is absorbing those two regions uh, uh, in all the directions. Unfortunately, we see uh, constant provocations on the occupation lines. We see, uh, you know, uh, kidnappings every day. Uh, Last year, only more than 300 uh, citizens were kidnapped from the occupation line. Unfortunately, we see uh, still um, uh, cases of murder and killing. Uh, you know, Giga Khozoria was Georgian IDP killed at the Abkhazia occupation line. Uh, and uh, uh, just recently this year, uh, IDP uh, from Skinwali was killed uh, in detention in Skinwali, and uh, the body was not returned to family for uh, a few weeks. So these are the provocations, constant provocations we are having on the occupation line and the in the occupied territories, as well as not only ethnic uh, discrimination, but uh, also ethnic cleansing happening there. Last year, for instance, in September, uh, the, the whole village, Eredvi, uh, was actually uh, erased from the map. Uh, all the Georgian house, houses of Georgian IDPs were taken down. And uh, under so-called Russian investment program, the farm, farming was developed in, in that village. So uh, these are the clear signs of uh, uh, ethnic cleansing, not only discrimination. Discrimination is happening there uh, every day. The, the people uh, are left uh, without right of education, right of uh, having property, 
owning property, uh, getting education in uh, native language, and etc. So the uh, challenges uh, are really uh, creating big obstacles for the full-scale development of Georgia. And uh, what we are trying to do is to find uh, peaceful ways for the conflict resolution. First of all, you know, we, we are trying to push Russia to fulfill its uh, ceasefire agreement of uh, 12 August 2008. Unfortunately, uh, there were 43 rounds held in Geneva. Uh, the Geneva <coughs> discussions were established under the ceasefire agreement, as you probably know, and as you know. But unfortunately, there is no any movement on any points of the ceasefire agreement. So you mentioned the non-use of force pledge from the Georgian side. There is no any uh, readiness from Russia to reciprocate. The fifth point of the ceasefire agreement uh, talks about the need of uh, withdrawal of Russian forces to the pre-war positions and establishment of international security arrangements on the ground, but there is no movement on that issue. There is no movement on the IDP uh, returning uh, issue. So to reinforce and uh, strengthen our positions in Geneva, we are working also in international organizations. And actually, during the last two years, uh, Georgia has uh, really uh, very significant results in international fora. Uh, we had uh, maximum support to our resolution in the UNGA, General Assembly on the uh, IDP, return of IDPs. We had uh, first time uh, resolution adopted by the UN Human Rights Council on the need of entry of international uh, humanitarian uh, monitoring bodies uh, in the occupied territories and uh, especially the uh, High Commission of Human Rights of the UN, which is, who is not allowed to enter the region. We are uh, actually working within the Council of Europe and uh, unprecedented decision was taken by the Council of Europe uh, this um, uh, spring, which talks about the uh, uh, Russia's uh, legal obligations as a uh, force uh, exercising effective control over the uh, occupied regions. It's a, in legal terms, it's a recognition of occupation by Russia of those regions, which was a very important uh, document. Unfortunately, uh, since 2008, uh, there were no uh, re relevant decisions made in international fora. There were no relevant even resolutions made uh, about uh, the Russian aggression uh, in Georgia. So we have to uh, do now even uh, much bigger efforts in order to achieve some results, especially when you have Syria, when you have Ukrainian uh, hot conflict and etc., to raise awareness of uh, the situation in the occupied regions of Georgia is much difficult than it was in 2008 or 2009 when Georgia was the only country uh, to be under the uh, aggression. But unfortunately, we failed at that time to uh, raise that uh, international attention. But now, actually, last two years were really, uh, really very uh, significant <coughs> in that regard. Also, uh, was uh, especially uh, significant here in the US as uh, Congress has first time um, put the language on the occupation of Georgian territories in its Appropriation Act, it was uh, also Congress and administration approved some kind of sanctions for the uh, countries which have some relations with the occupied territories. It's like uh, prohibiting any financing of uh, those governments and countries who have relations with the occupied territories. It was really very significant uh, mm -hmm. support from the U.S. and also uh, decision for non-recognition okay. because it is a great tool for us to work also with other countries yeah. on, yeah. on non-recognition. Um, and uh, generally, we try to use every format. Yesterday, I was uh, on the Security Council meeting. Uh, the debate was organized by the Polish presidency about the 
uh, protection of civilians in armed conflicts. Uh, if there is no hot conflict in Georgia, it doesn't mean that civilians are not suffering. The cases I brought is a real example how even in this situation when we don't have hot conflict, there are um, killings of civilians and the suffering of uh, civilians uh, due to this conflict. So I talked about that uh, on the Security Council. Russia is violating 39 Security Council resolutions. Mm -hmm. And Russia is in violation of all in its international obligations. Today, actually, there was last uh, hearing of uh, the um, case uh, in Strasbourg court about uh, Georgia-Russia-Georgia Russia, Georgia conflict. We hope that uh, Strasbourg court will take relevant uh, decision because we provided all relevant arguments about the violation of eight uh, actually <coughs> points of uh, the charter by the Russian Federation. So we work uh, with our diplomatic instruments, with our uh, um, actually peaceful policy in order to find ways how to push Russia to uh, deoccupy, fulfill its ceasefire agreements and fulfill its uh, international obligations. Right. And <clears throat> I'm very proud as an American that across administrations, Bush, Obama, and now Trump, the U.S. government has continued to recognize the presence of almost 10,000 Russian troops on Georgia's internationally recognized territory as an occupation. Uh, Vice President Pence made it very clear that it was an occupation on his visit last summer. And it's extraordinary to think that there are some of our European allies who still will not use the, the word occupation to describe the, the presence of Russian troops on Georgia's internationally recognized territory. I mean, they're not there on vacation, that's for sure. Um, Mamuka. Thank you. Uh, th thank you, Luke. Uh, excellent panel. panel. Um, thanks, Fiona, for promoting Georgian wines. That's important. <laughs> Uh, for, the, for the record, the uh, American Academy of Science published an article on uh, November 13, 2017, proving all this discovery of wines uh, found in Georgia. <laughs> uh, but my question is unrelated to wine in this case. It relates to security and relates to uh, some of the commitments that Russia and formerly Soviet Union had vis-a-vis -vis Helsinki process and uh, con conventional forces in Europe CFE treaty. Uh, and Russia withdrew from CFE Treaty in 2007 and in, is in violation of Helsinki uh, Final Act by occupying territories of other countries, including Ukraine and Georgia, of course. Uh, but at the same time, we, Western world, still uh, honor commitments to CFE Treaty on all those agreements, including Russia-NATO uh, 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 Act which prohibits permanent, station, permanent stationing of troops in, in Poland and Baltic states and so forth. So we still have troops there on a rotational basis. So my question is to U.S. government representatives. Uh, uh, are there any, any considerations uh, of changing some of those uh, maybe arrangements that are, uh, that are well, commitments that are made to Russia based on those agreements and uh, as we all understand, Russia only understands power politics. So by placing larger forces in Black Sea and Eastern Europe, somehow balance desire of Russia to be more assertive. And, uh, and by the way, I should mention that Black Sea is becoming a very important economic outlet for Russia. It's the largest, Norosisk is already the largest uh, oil out, outlet. And there are, in terms of trade, it's the largest, uh, largest trade port for, for Russia. So economically, Black Sea is very important for Russia. So if balancing Russia in Black Sea militarily in order to reduce appetites of aggressive actions, I think is essential. Any considerations of that in the US government? Thank you. Very good question. Thank you for that. So I, I mean, I think the Black Sea is not just becoming more economically important for Russia, it's also becoming more militarized uh, by Russia with the militarization of Crimea, a larger naval presence, um, the use of uh, the Black Sea to project power into the Eastern Mediterranean. Um, and it's precisely Russia's militarization of its Western and Southern military districts that I think have led to uh, a larger, if rotational, NATO presence all along the eastern flank. 
Um, and the United States, across administrations, has been increasing its commitment, whether um, uh, in the Baltics uh, or uh, the Black Sea uh, region. Um, I think our first priority is to rebuild uh, the strength uh, of our allies and partners. Um, and that is, I think, the essence of our effort um, to get NATO partners to have credible plans uh, to meet their Wales pledge. Um, the second, I think, is to bring Russia back into compliance with its international agreements, whether it's CFE or Helsinki Final Act or the INF Treaty uh, or Open Skies. Um, and that our first step uh, should be to try to get uh, Russia to live up to its obligations and to return to a stable, rules-based approach uh, to uh, international affairs, which will be far less costly to everyone um, than uh, having to confront uh, a dangerous uh, new world. But Fiona, do you have anything you want to add? Well, I'd like to add to this that we also have to be very careful, I mean, not just to think in um, conventional military terms. Um, we use the term hybrid war. I mean, the Russians don't use that because they think, of course, of kind of the more the totality of war in the information field, political, uh, economic, uh, not just in the military terms. And I think, you know, one of the challenges that we have to face is how to balance off uh, the kinds of approaches and um, investments that Robert has talked about uh, with also the commitment to building up our own. We've talked about it as resilience, our ability to resist, ability to withstand, to blunt or to stop uh, some of the other effects of, uh, of uh, Russia's approach to warfare uh, and, and aggression. I mean, Georgia has faced not just uh, the seizure of its territory and now the occupation of its territory, but cyber attacks. I mean, you were on the front line of many of the subversive attacks uh, that Russia um, has developed into an art form uh, that it is applying elsewhere, including here in the United States, but you know, across, uh, across Europe and in the Balkans and uh, in, in many other uh, places. And I think we have to have a shared commitment, uh, and Georgia has already shown uh, that it's very serious about tackling this. Um, to be able to figure out ways in uh, which we push back on this too. And to make it clear to Russia that it's not just, you know, kind of living up to the um, old agreements of CFE, but if we are to have a different relationship, if Georgia is to have a different relationship with this, you know, major neighbor of, it, of its, if the United States is to have a different relationship with Russia, a more positive one looking forward, not always constantly back uh, to old grievances or to um, old conflicts, then we have to do it on a, a completely different basis. And it's unacceptable uh, for Russia to use this coercive power, be it by military occupation and, and the seizure of territory, or be it by hostile cyber attacks or trying to subvert and undermine democratic processes and, uh, and governments. And that we have to stand together uh, to be able to uh, show to Russia that that isn't acceptable and to move forward to picking up our theme of the kind of the gateway and the crossroads, because we're at an inflection point in history. And if Russia wants to be part of a shared future, then um, it, it basically has to move forward on the basis that the partnership between Georgia and the United States is showing as the only way uh, uh, to, to build a common future together. So, I mean, it's complicated, it's very difficult, but I think if we continue to work together and to learn from each other, there are things that we can do. And the Black Sea, um, you mentioned the economic importance uh, and the energy importance, of course, <clears throat> but also then there's a, a political importance for the U.S. too. Yeah. The countries that form the Black Sea account, well, minus Russia, of course, but then the, other, the countries other than Russia, Bulgaria, Romania, Ukraine, Turkey, and Georgia, that are Black Sea countries, actually contribute one-third of all of the uh, resolute support um, troops in Afghanistan. So just these five countries contribute one third. So these are countries in the region that are, are serious about NATO security, serious about the, the, the three C's, cash, commitment, and, and a capability. Is that right? Yeah, cash, commitment, capability. And uh, we you know, yeah, we, we, we should, uh, you know, yeah. yeah, we should, you know, focus on, on the, the countries in this region too. Couple of ideas that um, I proposed in the past was uh, uh, creating a um, uh, like a, a Black Sea uh, maritime policing force based off the Baltic air policing mission. So have a have a permanent list of of NATO countries that will commit in advance to entering the Black Sea because, of course, non-Black Sea countries are restricted by the 1936 Montreux Convention. 
You can only spend 21 days at a time in the sea. There can only be seven non-NATO Black Sea or non-Black Sea countries in the Black Sea at any given time. And the aggregate tonnage, I think, is like 25,000 tons altogether. So there are huge restrictions on, on non-Black Sea countries operating in the Black Sea. So we need a commitment from the Alliance as a whole to find a way to patrol and be active in the, in the, in the Black Sea more. Another idea that impacts Georgia is um, create a, uh, a center of excellence for Black Sea security inside Georgia. Now, NATO has a bunch of centers of excellence that are uh, around the alliance. They're, they're certified by NATO. Um, and there hasn't been a center of excellence created um, that is in a non-NATO country, but there's a first time for everything. And I think it would help anchor NATO more into Georgia and into the Black Sea and acknowledge Georgia's importance not only to NATO, but to, to Black Sea security. And it could, the center could be used like the Center of Excellence for Cybersecurity in Estonia or the Center of Excellence for Energy Security in Lithuania uh, to help the Alliance and its partners better understand how to address some of the unique security challenges in the Black Sea. Um, so there, there's plenty of ideas out there on, on how to do this. Um, I think we have time for one May final I add question. To the Black sea oh yes, right. of course. Because this is a very important issue and uh, top priority for us. We want Black Sea to be a sea of development, peace, and stability. Because uh, you know we are developing new maritime connections <coughs> with the European market. We for the physical integration. You know this is key to overcome the challenge which has been created by Russia. And for that, you know, NATO presence on the Black Sea is very important. We uh, really um, welcome the uh, NATO focus on, on the Black Sea. Uh, we had uh, discussions uh, during the Warsaw Summit where we actually agreed to have a deeper dialogue uh, between NATO and Georgia on the Black Sea security. We've been contributing uh, with, uh, to uh, you know, to Black Sea security by providing information from the Georgian side. Unfortunately, there's been the one-way street until now. So we look forward to have more dialogue and, uh, you know, the more engagement also from NATO. We have uh, tabled our proposals uh, last year, a year ago, actually a little bit more than, than a year. We worked very uh, actively on that subject. Uh, and we hope that uh, deeper cooperation on the Black Sea security issues will be one of the outcomes of the uh, upcoming summit in Brussels. For sure. Yeah. Uh, we have time for one final question. I see up in the, the gallery, actually. Uh, it's coming. Yeah. Alex Malikishvili, IHS Market. Uh, thank you very much for, you, for the panel's comments, uh, informative and insightful. Um, I have two questions for the minister. Uh, one, uh, as Tatunashvili's case earlier this year abundantly showed, uh, Georgian, remaining Georgian population in the breakaway regions um, faces imminent threat from the separatist authorities. Now, uh, do you have, uh, does the Georgian government have any contingency plans whatsoever if and when separatist authorities decide to harass and mass the remaining Georgian population either in South Ossetia or in Abkhazia? That's my first question. My second question has to do with the uh, um, upcoming, please correct me if I'm wrong, but if I'm not mistaken, another meeting of Karasin uh, Abashidze format is supposed to take place in Prague fairly soon. And it's my understanding that the Russian government just recently finally signed on to the 2011 agreement that would entail monitoring of any goods that enter and leave breakaway regions uh, via the Swiss company. Can you update us on that? Thank you very much. Thank you for the questions. Uh, I will reiterate our strategy with regards to the occupied regions. Uh, I uh, talked about that uh, uh, during my previous answer. Our strategy is to find uh, peaceful ways for uh, solving those uh, problems and uh, ways uh, based on international law we are using all instruments uh, available uh, today, which are not as effective as we want to see them. But uh, these are the only instruments which exist today, unfortunately. These are 
international organizations which are actively involved uh, in the peaceful conflict resolution process. Uh, we use Geneva international discussions. We use uh, incident prevention and response mechanisms, which are established under the Geneva international discussion format. And <clears throat> with the mobilization of international community, we try to uh, actually um, push uh, the uh, occupation regimes uh, as much as possible. Uh, not to see the developments what we have uh, on the ground today. Unfortunately, this is not about separatist regimes, but it is about Russian policies, mm -hmm. which are uh, driving the, um, the processes and uh, um, policies on, on the ground. Uh, unfortunately, uh, we see uh, no any, uh, we don't see any readiness from Russia uh, to find uh, solutions even to the humanitarian issues. But again, we will use uh, all our international instruments uh, in our hands to uh, protect the rights of all people living on the occupied territories. It's not about ethnic Georgians, but also we believe that others, even Abkhaz and Ossetians living today under the Russian occupation, they are suffering a lot. They are suffering from the isolation uh, they are not allowed to have uh, any contact with normal contact with the international society, free world. They are under the big propaganda pressure. They are under the big KGB control. Uh, and uh, they are suffering a lot. So we have to find solution for everyone, not only for ethnic Georgians, but everyone living in the occupied territories. And therefore, government of Georgia, I have not answered that question during my previous answer, has elaborated uh, actually very important uh, program uh, called uh, Step for Better Future, which is about creating new opportunities for everyone living in the occupied territories. This is about creating uh, more confidence, uh, creating uh, more opportunities for reconciliation. I think that will create uh, some more positive environment uh, hope within the uh, uh, population in the occupied regions uh, and uh, help to finding peaceful ways for, uh, for the engagement. We cannot change, unfortunately, the uh, occupation regimes, which have uh, quite different agenda and different interests, different from uh, actually humanitarian interests. Uh, but uh, there is only way to counter that, you know, mo the full-scale mobilization of the international community, what uh, is now uh, the priority of the government of Georgia. When it comes to SGS, it's good that Russia finally signed the uh, contract uh, with the SGS. Uh, we hope that uh, Russia will start uh, implementing this uh, agreement which was signed in uh, 2011 uh, in line with the provisions of this agreement. Great. Um, well, that concludes the first panel. So please join me in thanking our, our panelists. <clears throat>